Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm going to, well, maybe I'll tell you guys a little bit about um, how I got to this journey of holistic medicine and some of the hats I wear. So um, probably like many of you, there's not just one hat that we wear. Many of us have multiple hats. Um, so one of uh, the things that I do is I have a, a medical practice, an integrative medical practice in Milford, Connecticut called Artemis Wellness Center. And that practice, we do naturopathic medicine, which is general practice medicine um, that focuses on nutrition, herbal medicine, supplements, and healthy lifestyle. Uh, we also do craniosacral, and I'm also a licensed acupuncturist. So what got me into naturopathic medicine um, was it, I really saw the value of nutrition um, growing up in a Mediterranean household. and. I wanted to go to a medical school that focused on nutrition and naturopathic medical school was the only uh, general practice trained medical education that had nutrition as a foundation in it. So, so that's what led me in that direction. Um, so there's Artemis Wellness Center, the practice in Milford. The other hat I wear, and I know you've had Dr. Bernie Siegel on a number of times. He is a, one of our local celebrities. Um, so he is my co-academic director at the Graduate Institute. It's a master's program in integrative health and healing. And it's a wonderful program for anyone looking for a master's degree in transformative healing in a sense. So it's an education that you learn a lot about different integrative therapies, but you also learn about yourself. So we've had many graduates go on to do things like start the Tully Center at Stanford Hospital and um, do more integration and holistic medicine and mindfulness in the classrooms in, term, in the school system. So it's a wonderful master's degree if you do want to focus on yourself and it's uh, a lot less stressful, I think, than conventional education these days. So that's another hat. And uh, there are a few other hats I wear. So I was teaching for the University of Bridgeport um, Nutrition and um, really enjoyed that class. And then the other hat, which is probably my most important hat, is mother of twins here in Woodbridge. And, you know, one of the reasons why um, I'm so invested in this more holistic integrative process is I realized the value of it for myself and in my life. And uh, the, the program I'm developing right now, it's a Mediterranean diet and lifestyle program. And the reason why I'm working on that is because I wanna reach more people um, in this time and help them to find simple solutions on how to eat, how to live, what kind of herbs and teas and, and simple ways to bring wellness into the kitchen. And um, there are many ways, even as busy moms, you know, I'm a single mom, so busy people can bring simple tools in to live a more sustainable healthy way of life. And sometimes it takes just being very mindful of the little things of making that cup of tea. Um, and uh, I have worked with, um, done some talks with Kara Sundland at WFSB, you know, on some of these uh, mindful living practices as well. So looking forward to telling you guys today about chronic systemic inflammation, which I wrote the book, uh, and I think I have it back there, The Anti-Inflammation Diet for Dummies a while back when I was pregnant with the twins with Molly Rossiter. And that was um, an eye-opening experience too, because it turns out the cause of disease is not high cholesterol. It's actually inflammation is that mediator between us and chronic disease. And I'm going to talk about that at length today. And there's a difference between the acute inflammation and chronic systemic inflammation. And we're really seeing that that is a very important key to general health and wellness. And there are many things that we can do to mediate that. So we'll dive into that today. We're talking today about decreasing systemic inflammation. So many of you have heard of inflammation and a, maybe acute inflammation, but what is this chronic systemic inflammation? And it's important to understand it because it really is one of the most important mediators of chronic disease, and there's a lot we can do about it. But I want to thank um, the Senior Center here in Woodbridge. Uh, I want to thank 
Jeanette, I want to thank Christy and Hua for helping to put this together. And I'm sure there's many more cooks to make the wonderful broth that is this uh, fantastic Woodbridge Senior Center that is local to me and, and really appreciate this opportunity. So systemic chronic inflammation, and I'm going to, what I'm going to put on lecture slides later is SCI. So think of sci-fi. If anyone's into science fiction, you know, that's a little acronym, but that stands for systemic chronic inflammation. So that can lead to several diseases and they are actually the leading cause of disability and mortality worldwide. So chronic disease, when you hear chronic disease, that's cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autoimmune disease, and neurodegenerative disorders, which does include dementia, Alzheimer's, um, et cetera. So, Chronic systemic inflammation is a very important piece of this puzzle in helping to reduce, prevent, and manage many of the chronic diseases that are the number one cause of mortality and disability worldwide. So you might know about short-term inflammation. If you've ever bumped your elbow or gotten a cut, that is the short-term inflammation or gotten a cold and then gotten over it. That type of inflammation, we need that to survive. So all inflammation isn't bad. And this is where, let's say you get a cold or you, you know, or you get a cut or you get a little bump or you hurt your knee. Then what happens is there's a trigger and our body brings the white blood cells. It brings um, circulatory cells. So you get that heat. Um, you get, you might not feel well, there's an inflammatory response. And this inflammatory response also tells the immune system to go there so that you can deal with it and get over it. And there's, if you're um, into the biology of it or the mechanism, some of you scientists out there, um, it's associated with this pathogen associated molecular patterns. They, they see that, that there's a particular mechanism and there's so much more to learn. Now this long-term chronic inflammation. This is the type of inflammation where you might, you know, uh, get a cut or you might get sick, but you're just in that chronic state of low level inflammation where you may not feel good and there may not be a test or a way to tell what's really going on. And how many of you have been to the doctors and not felt well, but yet your blood test looks great. And this chronic systemic inflammation, actually that's how it works. It works on this low level and it's very hard to detect. And one thing as a naturopathic physician that I do is I like to look below the surface of disease and look at the root cause and look at the normals and you know where things are so and in chinese medicine traditional chinese medicine we do that through pulse and tongue diagnosis so we can come up with solutions to shift some of these chronic inflammatory patterns and the reason why we can do that is because these long term chronic inflammatory process are influenced by diet some medications increase inflammation, social and environmental factors affect it. And so stress, um, depression, you know, uh, sense loss of purpose, all these things that are on the social and emotional levels, in addition to pathogens and illness and, you know, different nutrient deficiencies, these all promote chronic systemic inflammation. Now, these are associated more on a mechanistic level with these uh, DAMPs, damage associated molecular patterns. This is the cytokine dysregulation, oxidative stress. So many of you have heard of that cytokine storm. This is uh, related to some of that cytokine, this post-inflammatory issues is chronic systemic inflammation. So what are some of the biobehavioral things that you might notice um, when there is some type of inflammation. And with this pattern, um, so all of you know what it feels like when you're sick. You know, you might feel a little sad. Um, that anhedonia is another word for just not feeling motivated. You might be tired. There's re reduced libido. You might not be hungry. Um, altered sleep, social behavior, maybe feel a little withdrawn, you know, feeling um, 
on an emotional level that you want to kind of curl up in a ball and go away. Um, so we all know when we're feeling sick, we do not want to go out and party. We want to stay in. And this is what um, part of that is a evolutionary way of, of taking care of ourselves. There's also increased blood pressure, insulin resistance, the cholesterol um, molecules get affected. And these are important for survival. Um, but long term, you can see how these behaviors may not be optimal for health and wellness. So one thing we want to look at too, when we talk about chronic systemic inflammation, we want to look at the social, psychological, environmental, and biological factors that can help with, you know, getting that acute injury and then getting well. Um, because if we don't address it in a proper way, then it can turn into that chronic systemic inflammation. So what chronic diseases are caused by inflammation? And, and do you see the word cause there? It's a very important word. These are the causes. Heart and cardiovascular disease, high cholesterol does not cause heart disease. It's actually caused by inflammation. High cholesterol is a risk factor. High blood pressure is a risk factor. The true cause, the mechanism is actually inflammation. Diabetes and blood sugar dysregulation, cancer, chronic kidney disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autoimmune disease, neuro neurodegenerative disease and cognitive decline, chronic pain, and the list goes on and on, you know. So another thing you might be surprised to know, how many of you um, have heard of the theory that it's all, you know, depression, anxiety, it's all in your head. It's, it's genetically mediated. Oh, my family was depressed. So that's, you know, I have the gene. It's my neurotransmitters are imbalanced. Well, that's not entirely true anymore. And we know now there is research on neuroinflammation and depression. So looking at how neuroplasticity, neuro is brain plasticity, is very important. And those are mediated by inflammation. There it goes again. So there's specific mechanisms by which that's true. And you can see I have a very fancy slide here on how monoamine metabolism, neurocircuitory, glutamate metabolism, this is all on a biomechanical level, how inflammation affects depression and anxiety. So we definitely, by addressing inflammation through diet, through lifestyle, we can actually affect our risk of depression and anxiety and help to reverse it. So chronic inflammation, what's happening on a biomedical level? We know that it disrupts the immune response. It increases risk of disease. Those are the slides I just went over. It also decreases the immune response to vaccines. So there's research showing if, you, if you're getting a vaccine and you want that vaccine to work well, inflammation is not gonna help. And so by, by going on an inflammatory diet, by also taking probiotics, you know, there are ways that we can boost our immune system naturally. And that way, whatever medication we take at any point is actually gonna work better if we have that lower inflammatory response. Another really interesting thing is I see a lot of patients that, you know, they are not feeling well, they have a chronic inflammatory disease and it's not apparent where it came from. It turns out that during pregnancy and childhood, our risk of chronic disease will increase across our lifespan. So this is another reason why I really like focusing on women's health. I do a lot of work with women for fertility, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, menstrual disorders, because you know, by affecting a healthy pregnancy, we're actually affecting the health of three generations. And research has really shown that even with toxin exposure, by decreasing inflammation in moms, um, in one generation of pregnancy, in childhood, we actually can affect health for the generations to come. Another thing that chronic inflammation does, and this is part of how it's mediated, how many of you have heard of the microbiome or take probiotics or eat fermented food? The microbiome are the organisms that live in and on us. 
And it turns out we're just as many human cells as we are these microbial cells that make up our um, GI system that make, they're on our skin, so they affect skin health. Um, they also affect our, our neurotransmitter balance. So there are studies showing how fermented food, certain probiotics help affect depression and anxiety. It's because this microbiome, this world of, of organisms like the lactobacillus and the bifido are having a, a role in our immune system, in our response to inflammation, and on a number of inflammatory processes that make up optimal health and wellness. So how do we tell if we have this chronic systemic inflammation? Again, it's very difficult, but there was a study in, in Glasgow that um, 160,000 people, and they found that a combination of inflammatory markers, CRP, which stands for C-reactive protein, albumin, and something called a neutrophil count. So these are basic blood tests. You know, it's part of the albumin, the neutrophil count, that's part of a regular um, chemistry and CBC panel that your doctor would use. Um, CRP is an additional lab marker, very easy to test. I test this in my patients, especially the HSCRP, the highly sensitive CRP. And by looking at those inflammatory markers, they found it predicted all cause mortality. So all causes of death over eight years, in addition to mortality for cancer, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease, which is like stroke. So that's how important these, this low level, this systemic chronic inflammation is. Um, and it may go undetected. So there's no definitive test. You know, there's the CRP, there's the HSCRP. And one thing I do in my practice is I'm not content with just a total cholesterol, LDL, HDL. So I do have a program that's an advanced cardiovascular program for my patients. And what we do is we do a more advanced test. There's a cardiac um, IQ test by Quest we do. There's also Cleveland Heart Labs. I do some of the same lab testing uh, that Cleveland Clinic does for cardiovascular testing. But one thing it does is include some of those systemic chronic inflammatory markers. So we could really get a sense of, you know, what is your true risk of disease and what can we do about it? So uh, there's the HSCRP levels. And then, you know, there's multiple things that may be coming up, but I also test omega-3 content, which also tells us, you know, do you have anti-inflammatory markers? Because those fish oils, those omega-3s actually help, and we'll talk about that more later. Um, but another thing is there's something called the immunome. So looking at those cytokines, those chemokines, you know, the chronic systemic inflammation, it not only increases your risk of disease and mortality, it actually is the key to aging or anti-aging. So we do know that we age because of inflammation. And so by getting a handle on this inflammatory process, we're actually able to slow down and reverse some of this aging process. And these are the cytokines, the chemokines, also something called senescence associated secretory phenotype, these SASPs, um, there's oxidative damage, there's mitochondrial, there's telomere damage, you know, all of these things, inflammation is part of this process. And um, in terms of clinical symptoms, this is one thing that we can also look at in terms of clinical symptoms. If you're not feeling well, if you're not sleeping well, we do know which factors contribute on a diet and lifestyle manner to the systemic chronic inflammation. So I would like to empower you today with some of the tools to reverse that process naturally. So um, we have those internal causes, and so that's the DNA damage, the telomeres get affected. Those are the little, if you think of it like on your shoelaces, you have the little plastic thing on the end. So what kind of things influence this systemic chronic inflammation? And um, there's epigenetic disruption. Epigenetics is, epi means above. So it goes above genetics. So epigenetics is all of the things that influence from the time we were in our mother's womb up until now that affects 
our gene expression. So Dr. Bruce Lipton has some amazing lectures. I really, if you really want to learn more about epigenetics, um, watch the inner evolution by Dr. Bruce Lipton. It will blow your mind. And because it really shows how these other than above genetic influences that influence the protein sleeve on genes in terms of gene expression, how we can affect those with things like, you know, Dr. Bruce Lipton basically breaks it down into good vibes, which I love the way he breaks it down into that. So, you know, our uh, mental emotional state does play a role. Nutrition plays a role. Um, and so here's where we talk about diet and the things we can do for these endogenous causes, these inside causes, mitogenic signals, oxidative stress. You may have heard of these. And in my practice, I am an expert in nutritional supplements. Actually, naturopathic physicians are the only general practice trained physicians that learn about nutritional supplements throughout our four years of medical school. So, so we do have supplements that can affect some of these endogenous causes um, and research is ongoing, but I want to talk to you, I'll talk to you today more about the nutrition piece. So what about these other causes, uh, influences? These are the outside causes, the exogenous causes of psi, systemic, chronic inflammation, which we talked about is the leading cause of mortality, disability worldwide as a mediator. So chronic infections. So if we can make have a robust immune system where we're not having chronic infections, that's one way. Obesity, really, you know, our fat cells are amazing part of our hormone signals. And they have a so to speak, mind of their own. So the fat cells actually signal, can signal inflammation or they can help to signal other um, messages to our endocrine system to help it function well. And um, so, you know, weight is an influence, but it turns out some of the research on weight actually shows that if you're overweight and eating a healthy Mediterranean diet that's low in toxicity, your risk of developing what's called, you know, this is called cardia diabetes, your risk of developing diabetes and some of the chronic inflammatory disorders like cancer, diabetes, heart disease is actually, even if you're overweight, it's lower if you have less toxins because those toxins usually are fat soluble and they affect the fat cells. And, and one of the things that I do in my practice is work on detoxifying in a gentle, conscious manner with very clean um, you know, program so that we can affect the role that our fat cells have in chronic systemic inflammation. There's microbiome dysbiosis. So dys, you know, if any of you took Latin way back when, so this is like our biome, our microbiome, which is the, the bacteria in and on us, you know, plays a major role in our immune system and inflammation. And so a, a common example of dysbiosis would be like a yeast infection, or it could be, um, you know, after taking an antibiotic, the antibiotics kill the bad bacteria, but they also kill the good bacteria. And we also know even with COVID-19 that there is a disruption in the microbiome that occurs with chronic infection. So this, these all tie in together. Uh, and so whenever there, you don't have enough good bacteria, um, that can be a positive influence on inflammation in your immune system as opposed to the bad bacteria, like, you know, when yeast is overgrown or when there's um, C. difficile, which is the leading cause of nosocomial infections, you know, we see that that absolutely influences systemic chronic inflammation. Diet, we'll talk about that in detail, what we're eating, stress. So any tools you have to work on stress, definitely use them. Think of it as just as important as the water we drink and the air we breathe is doing things to reduce stress. Social and cultural changes, you know, and these are some of the things that, you know, we've had a major disruption in our society over the past, you know, year or more. And cultural changes can happen. And so how can we create some health and wellness harmony, a societal cultural harmony to decrease, you know, any stressors related to that? And, you know, Woodbridge Senior Center is doing that. So thank you for doing your part in that. So, um, 
those definitely play a role in systemic chronic inflammation. Low physical activity. So, you know, get out that, you know, the bike or start walking, eat Tai Chi. There are a number of classes offered at Woodbridge Senior Center and around. So take some of those classes, go for a walk. Even if you're sitting watching TV, maybe do some weights or something to get your body moving because physical activity, exercise actually works like a natural antidepressant. Studies show it's just as effective. And so physical activity is not only good for inflammation, but it's also good for your mind and body. Poor quality sleep. Many of my patients um, tell me, you know, we, we'd work on a number of things, but sleep is one of the issues that I see um, is so important, not only for it actually affects your risk of um, cardiovascular disease, and it also affects your ability to lose weight. And there's a number of other things that if it shifts your microbiome, that microbiome dysbiosis you see here, you know, sleep also is a part of that. So um, especially with my patients, I want to work on their sleep before I would say, oh, let's take a medication for this, that, or the other. We work on what's called the therapeutic order. We start with the ground, we start with the ground up, start with a good nutrition, lifestyle, sleep, physical activity. That goes a long way, a long, long way. And some, you know, some very simple things for sleep we can talk about, but you know, meditation, chamomile tea, there are some very simple things. And then I do also personalize nutritional supplements for sleep for my patients. Some medications actually increase systemic chronic inflammation as well. So you want to really be careful, talk to your doctor about, you know, are you on a medication that is creating some low level inflammation? And if there's a way to get off of it safely, then that would be a conversation that you can have with a naturopathic physician or an integrative practitioner since we do both. Um, so, and then love to collaborate with your, you know, medical doctor. If we can create a little more collaboration, I think we're going to really see a shift in the systemic chronic inflammation. Environmental and industrial toxins. So when I first moved to Woodbridge, uh, which is over five years ago, I insisted, because I had the, the kids were little, that we test our water and do it like a very, it's more expensive, more detailed. And it turns out the water was high in cadmium and uranium. So people had been living here for years before. And so that's the type of thing where, you know, our toxins, environmental toxins, may be right in our backyard. And so we need clean water. Um, food is another place where environmental toxins seep in. So this is why I'll talk about diet later, but getting good quality food, where whether it's organic or biodynamic, you know, you really want to get good quality food to minimize the toxins you're getting in through your diet, through your water, through the air. There's ways that we can do that. And some of them you know, there are studies, unfortunately, that have been shown, you know, I have some patients that are suffering still from the Chernobyl incident, you know, that whose immune system has been affected by environmental disasters. So let's hope we don't have any more of those, but there are things we can do to maximize our ability to fight inflammation with our fork and with our minds and with our spirit. So this here is a study that I really loved because we talked about that microbiota, that micro, that gut bacteria. It's a really important part of healthy aging and decreasing inflammation. And those two go hand in hand. So healthy aging, decreasing inflammation, it's really, we're talking about the same thing. And so this study showed that it was a study in a cross um, sectional study in China. And it found that, um, people, elderly people who are up to 100 years old actually had a very similar gut microbiome to 30 year olds. So that's how important your gut microbiome is in health and wellness and in anti-aging. And a really easy way to affect your gut microbiome is by a healthy diet, a plant-based diet. We'll talk about that. Let's talk about diet. So what can we do about systemic chronic inflammation? which is the major cause of disability, mortality, and chronic disease worldwide. Well, we can affect this inflammation with our fork. 
Ayurvedic pro proverb says, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. When diet is correct, medicine is of no need. And I have absolutely seen that in my Mediterranean family, in uh, the research I've done on the Mediterranean diet through the years where I interviewed people. My great aunt um, passed away at 107, and she liked to lie about her age. I did it. Uh, I have an article if you go on my website, drartemis.com, on it's called Evgeria, which is like healthy aging. And she talked about how she had olive oil. She wasn't on any medications at the time that she passed away either. So it was really growing up. And many of you may have grown up in, in a diet and environment very different than the one that we have now in the United States. And so let's get back to our roots. Let's get back to these traditional diets that decrease inflammation, that make us more resilient to aging and aging through uh, inflammatory damage, through mitochondrial damage. Um, so one thing we can do is know what to avoid. And you may know this, but I'm going to go over it again. Um, hydrogenated trans fats. How many of you remember when Crisco came on the market? Right. So I know my mom talked about that. It was this amazing thing, this like, oh, this shortening that was like butter and it was so much cheaper and you could use it so easily. That was our first insult with hydrogenated or trans fat. So you really want to look at labels. And if it says hydrogenated or trans, leave it alone because that will increase inflammation. It, it it increases bad cholesterol, decreases good cholesterol, and it is found in many prepared foods. So one thing I'm gonna do with the Mediterranean diet program that I'm starting soon at my practice, it's an online program, is there's gonna, we're gonna have uh, some private Facebook groups. So people are gonna have an opportunity to bring in what's in their, in their cabinet, in their pantry, so we can really see what we need to get rid of and what we need to keep. And if someone has something they wanna to share today at the end of this lecture, please feel free. I really wanna help you to revise uh, your pantry, revise your menu so that you can um, decrease your risk of systemic chronic inflammation and promote healthy aging. Oils high in omega-6s, so like corn oil, some of the safflower oils. So you really wanna watch omega-6s are a class of fats. If you have more omega-6s compared to the omega-3s, which are the ones in fish, which are the ones in sardines, walnuts, flaxseed, then you will increase arachidonic acid, which is actually a pro inflammatory cytokines. So, so that is balancing the good to bad fats is really important. And having some of those, what's called monounsaturated fatty acids. So that's like the olive oil and, um, you know, flax and walnuts, chia um, is, is actually has the omega threes in it too. Too much or too little salt. So I did write too little in there. So there's some research out there that shows that if you have too little salt, it also can increase your blood pressure or increase your risk. So too much salt and, you know, really, you know, a little sea salt on food every once in a while is, is fine. What you want to watch out for is that added salt that you have, like in, that are in canned foods, that's in hamburgers, in, in these processed foods. That's where you really see the salts that are going to be a problem. High amounts of saturated fat from processed meat. So there was a study that showed that meat is actually, saturated fat is not the cause of heart disease. And there were some studies that showed that, you know, saturated fat really isn't that bad, but it, unless it came from processed meats and processed meats are things like the prepared hamburgers, the prepared foods, um, you know, fast food. So, uh, hot dogs. So things that are pro meats that do not look like the original animal. So I'm not talking about like a grass fed lamb chop, you know, that would be fine every once in a while. I'm talking about the, um, you know, a pot roast with some really good quality beef every once in a while. That's fine. But this is where the hamburgers, the prepared meats, the sausages too much, you know, of those types of foods, not, not good for inflammation. Refined sugar. So this is found everywhere. So avoiding sugar in, you know, that white sugar. Artificial sweeteners. How many of you are surprised by that one? 
Anyone out there surprised by artificial sweeteners? They increase inflammation and they also increase risk of diabetes. And um, so it's working through that microbiome. There are studies showing that artificial sweetener. So that's the Splenda, that's the sucralose. You know, these are the things that I know on the Atkins diet is really popular to add some of these artificial sweeteners. Those are not good for you. They increase inflammation. So if you're going to have something sweet, you're better off with like a raw honey, a little bit of maple syrup, some of the natural sweeteners. Um, there's also nowadays we have things like stevia. So artificial sweeteners, any blue or pink or yellow packs, leave them alone. Non-organic dairy products. The reason why this is on the list is because we talked about how the fat cells, you know, being overweight increases our risk of getting sick, of chronic disease, of heart disease, of diabetes, of inflammation. And the fat cells, they are the place where fat soluble toxins accumulate. So where do you think, you know, they test, like, how do you think they test the amount of toxins found worldwide, um, you know, fat soluble toxins? They actually test the butter. So, you know, this is where non-organic dairy products are where you're going to have a higher concentration of some of these toxins that can affect the fat cells that increase the inflammation and that subsequently can increase the risk of chronic disease if you have too much of it. So, you know, really worth spending the extra money on organic butter, on organic dairy products, um, as much as you can. Additives, preservatives, food colors, and natural flavors. Avoid those. Those, your body does not know what to do with those, and they actually increase inflammation. So emulsifiers are on that list. But these are the, you know, this is the list that when in the Mediterranean diet, and lifestyle program um, at um, coming up through, um, you know, you can keep, stay tuned, drartemis.com. I'll give you that information. We're going to go over these in great detail in that program because it's one simple thing you can do to decrease your risk of chronic disease, decrease your risk of systemic chronic inflammation, and subsequently decrease your risk of the number one causes of mortality and disability worldwide in terms of chronic disease. So guess what diet I'm going to talk about today? So, and diet in Greek actually means way of life. So don't think about going on a diet. This is like a way of life. And I love the Mediterranean diet. I'm a little biased because I did grow up in a Mediterranean household. My parents were, my mom is the direct import from Crete. My father's parents came from Crete. Um, in Greece, but this is actually, it was a poverty diet. So this is the way your grandmothers or your, you know, if you look at a traditional diet, whether it's from Japan or China or South America or Spain or, you know, any part of the country, the traditional diet that was, you know, is very similar to a Mediterranean diet. There's the Nordic diet as well that has similar results, but this is a diet and lifestyle that is the number one, it's been shown to be the number one diet years over. Um, and it decreases inflammation. It promotes a healthy microbiome, which we saw is one of the factors that affects chronic system, systemic inflammation. And it will decrease your risk of chronic disease. It also helps to manage. So there's a lot of studies showing how the Mediterranean diet, especially low carb Mediterranean, helps with diabetes management, um, also helps with depression also helps with Alzheimer's, dementia. So there's many reasons why this diet is a good choice for many people. And why is it a good choice? So what's the evidence, you know, and there are thousands of studies on it, but this diet is high in antioxidants. What are antioxidants? Antioxidants, you see antioxidants, it's antioxidation. One of the ways that our cells get damaged um, by inflammation is oxidation. So they have the antioxidants in it. These are the veggies, the fruits, the herbs, the spices. They're nutrient dense. So in my book, um, The Naturopathic Doctor's Guide to Wellness for Immune Support, I talk about how you can protect your immune system. Like what, and one of the things that affects our immune system is nutrient deficiency. 
whether it's vitamin D, zinc, selenium. So the Mediterranean diet is nutrient dense. You're going to get really um, a good amount of nutrients in a Mediterranean diet. It's high in anti-inflammatory oils, good fats, the omega-3 fatty acids called polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's fish, wild-caught salmon, sardines, mackerel. You also see that in uh, walnuts, flax seeds, um, chia seeds. So the omega-3s, it's also high in those monounsaturateds that I talked about. Those are the nuts and seeds. So snacking on almonds or um, snacking on pumpkin seeds, this is where you get those monounsaturated fats. Extra virgin olive oil as your primary source of fat for cooking. How many of you are doing that already? And if you're not, um, that's another thing in the Mediterranean diet program that we're going to be talking about is how to judge a good quality olive oil, what to use. There are many choices out there and you really want to make sure, a couple of very simple tips, make sure it says extra virgin olive oil on it. If you can get it organic, great. Um, and taste it. it. You want to feel that like tickle almost, a little spiciness in the back of your throat. And that means it has something called oleocanthal in it, which works similar to ibuprofen. And um, so. We'll talk more, you know, I can talk more about that with the program, but, you know, taste your olive oil and use, you can you use it for frying, for cooking, make that your primary source of oil. You could use a little coconut here and there, but it really does not have the anti-inflammatory benefits of an extra virgin olive oil. Medicinal foods, herbs, spices, and teas. So that's a part of the um, Mediterranean diet. So let me break it down in terms of food as medicine. This is what it looks like. And fresh seasonal fruit high in vitamin C and antioxidants. You want to get um, some fruit in there. Now, be careful if you're diabetic. I would lean more towards the one. Make sure it's low glycemic, like berries. Um, but get seasonal fruit, go to your supermarket, see what's fresh, see what's good. If you can grow something in your backyard, even better. Um, I think I have to bring one more person in. Oop, hold on one second. Oh, sorry, one moment. I have to let my mom in. Excellent. Welcome, mom. So I'm talking about the Mediterranean diet. And um, so my first introduction to the Mediterranean diet was from my mom. We grew up in a household where, you know, there was always fresh seasonal fruit. And we also, another really important part of the Mediterranean diet is vegetables and leafy greens. At least two and a half cups. If you can go towards that five to nine servings a day, actually you're gonna decrease your risk of mortality, infl inflammatory disorders very quickly um, because that's a lot of antioxidants, a lot of anti-inflammatory. So these are um, the things where you wanna look at the leafy greens, um, you know, broccoli, you wanna look at things like kale and spinach. And um, in my house, we also did wild edible greens called corta, which would be things like, you know, broccoli rob. And uh, you see this in the in Mediterranean cooking. You see um, even wild foods like amaranth with olive oil and lemon juice. And you get additional components when you, when you cook it that way, when you steam it or when you um, parbroil it. Whole grains and gluten-free grains. So I, I put gluten-free grains here because we are currently in a time in society where we have so much inflammation coming at us from so many levels, whether it's mental, emotional, whether it's environmental toxins, whether it's through you know um, many things that we're exposed to, that a lot of people can't tolerate gluten as well as they used to. So if you have celiac or you have a little sensitivity, um, you can certainly do Mediterranean diet gluten-free. Um, but if you don't, you feel free to include those whole grain bread, um, especially sourdough, fermented grains are really good. So whole grains, uh, um, grains high in minerals, fiber, zinc, plant protein. So 
The Mediterranean diet is a plant-based diet. And even though it's an omnivorous diet, which means that you can have a little grass-fed meat, you can have some wild-caught fish on it, you really want to focus on the beans, the nuts, the seeds. And I am not a fan of uh, the fake uh, meat because it is, you know, to me, that's in a category of uh, processed food, because if it's not coming from nature, then we don't have the benefit of that soil bacteria, the microbiome. It, we don't have the benefit of the nutrients that naturally, like an animal would grasp, be on grass fed, eating those things in the grass, which has those omega-3s. That's another way to get some of the omega-3s in is through grass. And so uh, plant proteins the best ones are beans, nuts, and seeds. And so keep the beans in the diet. That is, if you're not having beans in your diet, you're not on a Mediterranean diet. And so you wanna cook it well. If it upsets you, it might take a while because the gas produced by the beans is actually a sign that your microbiome is working. And if you haven't had beans for a while and you have beans, you might wanna try a little lemon juice on it to cut the gas. Thank you, mom, for that tip. Um, you might want to put some caraway seeds, have a little peppermint tea afterwards, chew on some fennel seeds that's done in traditional Indian cooking so that you can calm that uh, reaction until your body gets used to it, until your microbiome changes, until you get the enzymes to break it down. But, you know, a nice lentil soup once a week would be a great way to do that. Healthy fats, we talked about that, extra virgin olive oil organic fermented dairy and eggs. So you can have up to four a week and eggs do not increase cholesterol. That's a myth. So, but they do, you know, they're not something you want to have necessarily every day. They are very healthy, um, especially, but you want to get them from grass fed free range. So if your neighbor has eggs, that's where I get my eggs. Thank you neighbors. Um, then that's the best way to get them. Um, organic fermented dairy, and you can have like yogurt would be good. Um, the Greek yogurt is higher in protein and lower in sugar. So that would be a good choice. Um, and then you can look at kefir. My neighbor gave me some kefir and that was so wonderful. So um, there's different ways of doing that as well. Grass-fed organic meat in moderation, one to four times a week at most. Okay. So the other thing on the Mediterranean diet is herbs and spices. So it turns out that just a little bit, like even rosemary, just a little bit of rosemary can help actually with cognitive function. And so um, the dose doesn't matter so much because a little bit can change the flavor, as you know, and a little bit can go a long way in terms of antioxidant, um, anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties. In the Mediterranean diet, we do a lot with oregano. And that has, it, it kills yeast, it has antibacterial properties, and there's um, many different uh, functions of herbs and spices. Teas. So very simple thing you can do is something like green tea is actually not a traditional Mediterranean diet, but green tea is very high in antioxidants. And it turns out the component called ECGC found in green tea even works on that uh, ACE2 uh, um, receptor site for COVID. So some of the supplements that I carry and recommend for my patients for prevention has that green tea extract in it. Wild edible plants, other, other teas too, malotira, you've got chamomile, so we can explore those further. Um, but wild edible plants, also I mentioned those wild edible greens. Plants that are living outside and that we collect from our garden. So I, I want you guys to do me a favor, and this might be a hard favor for some of you please don't spray your garden. And if you don't spray your garden, if you don't put the pesticides, if you don't put the insecticides on it, you're gonna get some free food and you're gonna get some health food. And so if you have sprayed it in the past, wait a year at least, but dandelion greens, if you can get them from a place without toxins, they're very high in minerals, they have antioxidants in them, um, the whole plant has been shown to reduce uh, blood sugar. And so, and they are delicious. So you can buy them at the store, but if you want them for free, just don't spray your garden and then know how to identify them. I have on my Instagram at Dr. Artemis Morris, a lot of posts on how to forage in the wild, which is a lot of fun and good exercise. So dandelion greens are an example of that with olive oil and lemon juice. 
So if you are wondering about the mechanism and the science behind this as well, there is a lot of science behind what I'm telling you. And that's probably one of the reasons Mediterranean diet has been number one in terms of, you know, what cardiologists recommend. And also um, many doctors recommend worldwide and has actually influenced the Mediterranean um, diet, has influenced the, the food pyramids uh, across the globe. So it has a lot of antioxidants, trace elements, minerals, vitamins. It improves the balance of the immune system and it down-regulates um, something called ad cell adhesion molecules. And so this is how it's working to prevent heart disease, which the first studies by Dr. Enzo Keys really showed, you know, Mediterranean diet was the best diet to prevent heart disease. Even in people who have had a heart attack, it, that was a lion heart study, 60% reduction in having another heart attack or dying from one um, by going on Mediterranean diet, but a lot of studies out there. So you can see here, it's those polyphenols, like in the extra virgin olive oil, the lycopenes, this is the tomatoes, and um, many fruits um, and veggies have these, the trace animal, element, elements and minerals, the vitamins, a lot of vitamins and good food, in fresh food and seasonal food, and those omega-3 fatty acids. So if you're wondering, you know, if, if you have some, if you don't didn't like biology or chemistry, I'm just gonna make this really easy. What that basically means that, you know, one of those points on that study is that when you're taking in, um, um, when you're eating on a Mediterranean diet, these monocytes, so these are the, the white blood cells, these are the immune cells, they can't stick to the blood uh, vessel walls as easily. And so, you know, there's a number, and that's when, when the plaque and the inflammation, again, the cause of heart disease is not high cholesterol, it is inflammation. And this is how it's working. So that inflammation causes the thickening and the transformation of that arterial lumen is like those blood cells to get plaque and that could lead to heart attacks, stroke. Um, this also affects um, uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. It affects neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, dementia. We know that inflammation is a big part of those as well. So this is how the Mediterranean diet has effects on all uh, on that process and especially that extra virgin olive oil, those omega-3s. So I mentioned earlier, make extra virgin olive oil your main source of fat of cooking. And these are all the reasons why. So helps with cholesterol metabolism, prevents platelet aggregation, prevents the sticking of those platelets to help circulation, has anti-tumor properties, um, helps with high blood pressure, helps with blood sugar metabolism and diabetes, um, helps with the white blood cells, the B cells, actually helps with osteoporosis, helps on bone calcification, bone mineralization, reduces the risk of neurodegenerative diseases. So that's dementia, that's memory, that's Alzheimer's, extra virgin olive oil. Anti-inflammatory properties for helping with genes, digestive health. It ha actually helps with digesting of fats prevents the oxidative stress. Also, there's studies showing that extra virgin olive oil topically can prevent skin cancer. So, you know, it's not only good inside, it's good outside. Um, as my mom can attest to, anytime something cut, bruise, anything, put some olive oil on it and it actually works. Um, antimicrobial properties as well. So I am doing, and I kind of surprised um, the Woodbridge Senior Center. I didn't, I forgot to mention I was doing that, but I want to give someone a book. I want to give away a book to someone. So I am going to take a moment to look at the chat and see who's going to get the book. And if and I'll just need your um, email address and, and then you can give me your address. I'll send it to you. So there's a book that I wrote called A Naturopathic Doctor's Guide to Wellness for Immune Support. If you can answer this question correctly, um, how many tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil daily does it take to reduce blood pressure? So I am waiting patiently on the chat and the first one to come up with the right answer is gonna get a book. Okay. 
Okay, any responses? I'm looking at the chat now. So I'm just gonna write it in the chat too. How many tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil daily? Oh, Jeanette, you won! Jeanette, congratulations! Wow, okay. Um, and I would be happy to pass it on to any one of our clients who is looking to um, read more about this topic. So we'll, if anyone writes to me and says, I would really like, we'll make it a borrowing book. Everyone oh, can share it. Excellent. So I will drop it off at the senior center. I love it. Fantastic. Okay, here we are. Congratulations. So yeah, just two. Two tablespoons, 30 mils a day of extra virgin olive oil can reduce blood pressure. So uh, uh, average reduction, this is systolic blood pressure, SBP. So if you just reduce it by three millimeters of mercury, it could lead to an 8% reduction in stroke mortality, 5% reduction in mortality from ischemic heart disease. So you see how easy it can be to affect some of the chronic systemic inflammation. So can you fry with olive oil? The answer is yes. I know that will surprise many of you, but I definitely grew up in a household where we fried everything in olive oil because, and you know, if you look at traditional diets from Spain, from Italy, from Morocco, like, you know, if only, the only oil you had was extra virgin olive oil or olive oil, then that's what you fried with. And it's actually the best oil to fry with. It has a pretty high smoke point, 350 to 410 Fahrenheit, but it turns out smoke point doesn't really mean anything when it comes to frying. So there's studies showing that it, smoke point is really not a good measure of that. So when you fry with extra virgin olive oil, so this morning I did have some eggs. I cut up some shallots, put some eggs in there, and I fried with the extra virgin olive oil and it was delicious. So don't be afraid to use that for all of your cooking and there's different types of olive oils that, you know, again, when I, when I talked about the Mediterranean diet program coming, that's one of the things we'll go into. So Mediterranean lifestyle, how many of you have been to the Mediterranean or have seen this scene, you know, where like, it's usually the guys hanging out, drinking coffee or having a shot of this or that, right? So ladies, we also need to be out there. Okay. This is, this is for everyone, but, um, you know, taking time for social time and i know it's hard now and so this is our best next best thing but taking time for sleep you you know taking a nap every day was actually shown to help reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease so so if you need a little siesta time social and community support exercise walking tai chi being in nature is very important for a healthy lifestyle is just connecting with nature um, sense of purpose spiritual connection, pleasure, and play. So if anti-aging and healthful aging is one of the things you're looking at, um, I really like this quote, uh, wrinkles merely mark where the smiles have been. And the more you smile, the happier you are, the less inflammation you're producing. So you wanna keep that in mind. And I really liked this quote, aging is just another word for living. So how do you wanna live? It, do you want to live in a way that decreases systemic chronic inflammation? And, and the, the truth is, if you do, you're actually living happily, more happily, you're, and healthfully. So being happy is actually being healthy when we look at lifestyle and how that affects systemic chronic inflammation. And when you eat well, it, it does feel really good. Um, so thank you so much for your time and attention today. And if you have some questions, I am happy to take them. Any questions today? Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, I really appreciate having this time with you and wish you well. And I hope you feel now that you know what systemic chronic inflammation is and how it is the leading cause of death and disability worldwide and how it affects chronic disease. You know all the factors that influence it and also you know what to do about it. You know, looking at a plant-based diet, a Mediterranean diet, having extra virgin olive oil in your diet, 
taking time to rest, taking time to be happy. And um, that will go a very long way. And uh, thank you again for your time. Thank you, Woodbridge Senior Center. And wishing you well. If you want to know more, um, drartemis.com. Stay tuned for um, the different things coming up. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. We really appreciate you coming. It's, it seems like everyone here must have learned a lot because there was a lot of yeah, material there. I took copious notes. Um, again, I'm happy to share um, the book if you want. We'll, we'll negotiate that and then I can share that book with any of the seniors who want to learn more about this topic and then follow it up with you for further advice and uh, consult. Um, and Christy, you want to have closing words? I just want to also um, say thank you for being here again and for the very informative presentation. It was wonderful um, and very enjoyable. I'm sure everybody else enjoyed it as well. And we do have a, a lot of our clients who do view this over um, Channel 79. So thank you to Pua for, for making that happen as well. And I just want to just mention that the next um, lecture will be on May 14th and it will be on keeping your financial health and well-being by avoiding scams or a little um, different direction in, um, in health. It's going to be related to financial this time. And it will be presented by Christine Buck, who's a legal investigator from the state of Connecticut Attorney General's office. So we hope to see you there as well. And thank you, Dr. Morris, once again. Thank you for this opportunity. And I'm happy to share a link. There's a free link on my website to the treatment plan. So I'll, I'll share that with you as well. Thanks, Dr. Morris. Thanks Thank for you joining so us. Thank you. It was wonderful today. Day. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye-bye.